All right. Wednesday at 5.05 .05 almost. I'm going live a little early so that I can get some of the uh, multi-layered tech stuff rolling by 5.05. .05. So uh, go ahead and let me know in the chat where you're watching from. Here at the Cry Base, tonight begins Seek His Face, which is uh, a conference, an event that we've been planning for months. Those of you who are on the email list already know about this. I think a couple of you may even be here. It'll be interesting to see. and Sean Malone, who is over CRY, Crisis Response International. We've got Don Potter, who will be coming in tonight. We've got Dean Briggs, who's coming in, I believe, tomorrow night. Uh, so it's going to be an incredible few days here at the CRY Missions Base. In we'll do Supernatural Theology, so I'm really uh, thankful for that. This may actually be the final week that we talk about the generation of Jacob. We've been on that theme for four months, maybe even a little longer than that, uh, but I'm feeling like this is... I see there's new people joining, so do go ahead and let us know in the chat where you're watching from. Please share the video also, especially if you're on Facebook. That would be really helpful. If you're on YouTube, please subscribe. Wherever you're watching, like the video, and uh, that'll be really Really been encouraging me, feeding my spirit, strengthening my faith. So I want to share something with you that I believe can really strengthen you and really uh, give you grace to walk in the peace of God, the presence of God, the ease of walking with God. that if you're not on our email list and you want to be, all you have to do is send us an email at supernaturaltheology at gmail.com uh, and we'll add you to the list. We send about one email per month to let you know when Spirit and Council That's a uh, interactive prayer and worship time that we do together online, uh, live streaming. So if you want to be on the email list, send us an email, supernaturaltheology at gmail.com, uh, and you know we'll be able to get that information out to you. Uh, somebody says, face view has audio. Now, I don't know what that means. Uh, but if you're saying that there's an issue with the audio, spell that out in the chat for me so I can fix it. Uh, let's see here. I think I can work on fixing that. Might have an issue. Check, check, testing, testing. Check, check, testing. One, two. All right, so you're telling me there's an issue with the sound. Let me try to fix this real quick here. Give me two. And let's see if this has fixed it now. Testing, testing, one, two. Testing, one, two. Check, check. All right, let me know if this has fixed the sound issue. Uh, I see you are letting me know now about the audio issue, but tell me if it's fixed now. I just changed the audio settings, uh, and it should be fix now relatively anyway. I'm not a tech guy. I'm not an audio guy, uh, but I have uh, a few tricks up my sleeve and hopefully I was able to just fix it. So let me know now if it is working. Uh, so I've got 
this testing one two and this testing one two all right i believe it's fixed now so uh as we go if there's any issue just let me know i'll keep an eye on the chat okay so we're going to get into probably the conclusion of the generation of jacob it's going to have to be a shorter video uh, because I need to go across campus and get ready for our meeting tonight, which is going to be so good. Uh, so here we go. All right, let's just pray. Lord, we do thank you, God, that you are teaching us. God, that you are leading us from glory to glory, from strength to strength. And God, we pray as we've considered the life of Jacob for months Lord, that we would be those who walk as the generation of Jacob, those who seek your face. God, those who open the heavens for the King of glory to come in. And we just pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to be on us tonight, that we would be able to really receive something to strengthen our spirit tonight from your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, here's something that I've been meditating on. Uh, just as I've kind of finished this long study of the life of Jacob, uh, I've been considering how God often refers to himself as the God of Jacob. Now, he also calls himself sometimes the God of Abraham, and he calls himself the God of Jacob. So over 350 times in the Bible, Jacob is mentioned. About half of those are in Genesis, where it's talking about Jacob, you know, the person, and then the other half is spread out throughout the rest of the Bible where God refers to himself as the God of Jacob or he calls Israel Jacob. And so why is that? Why is God continually either referring to himself as the God of Jacob or he is referring to Israel as Jacob? You know, we know that obviously whenever he's calling our attention to Jacob, either because he's saying, I'm the God of Jacob, or he's saying Israel, rather than calling them by their new name, Israel, he's calling them Jacob. He's calling to our remembrance the life of Jacob. There's something about Jacob that he wants us to understand. Whenever he says, I'm the God of Jacob, he's saying, Remember the way that I interacted with Jacob. Remember who Jacob was and remember his relationship with me. And whenever I refer to myself this way, I want you to think about the way that I interacted with Jacob so you think of me as that kind of a God. And whenever he's referring to Israel as Jacob instead of Israel, he's highlighting certain characteristics about their life or about who they are. You know, Israel means wrestling with God or the one who wrestles or contends with God. And Jacob is the, the taker by the heel. You know, that's, that's highlighting the qualities of Jacob's life before his process, before he was changed and given a new name. You know, that part of him that was uh, dealing with a father wound, knowing that he didn't have the favor of his father, that part of him that was, you know, that would lie, cheat, or steal to get the blessing, you know, that part of him that would, uh, that would usurp or that would deceive. And so there's something that God's saying to us over and over again. And I think that this is a very healthy perspective for us to have both on our ourselves, not that I'm about to say that we're all deceivers, that's not where I'm going with that, but the way that God interacted with Jacob and the reason that he keeps calling himself the God of Jacob is he's, I think he's trying to give us a paradigm to live our life by. So what is actually Jacob's story about? We've been looking at it for months and one of the things it's definitely about is it's not primarily a story that wows us because of the faithfulness of this man or the remarkable, you know, character or the remarkable faith or, you know, this story of somebody who was perfection, right? No, it's the story of how God chooses someone, God sovereignly chooses someone and the Lord pursues him throughout his life and the heavens are opening around his life. You remember all the times we looked at, uh, there's like, uh, there, there's really about 10 different times where heaven breaks in 
in Jacob's life. We looked at the seven visitations of Jacob. There's really about 10 though, but there's seven with specific characteristics that we looked at. But one of the dominant characteristics of his life is that the windows of heaven are opening and God is breaking through or he's running into the camp of angels or God is stepping into someone else's dream to warn them not to mess with Jacob. And so he's both a man in process, you know, God walks him through probably 15 or more years with Laban and Laban was you know, constantly trying to, uh, you know, he was mistreating Jacob and he was trying to get the upper hand on Jacob. And so God is is working something in him as he's dealing with Laban. You know, he's, Jacob, because of his own, uh, his own interactions with Esau, because of the way that, you know, he, he kind of deceived Esau, but Esau also was willing to, to give up his birthright for a bowl of stew. And so, uh, and then he later went in, Jacob went in and took Esau's blessing by deceiving Isaac. And so Jacob had something hanging over his head because of his own bad behavior, because of his own bad choices, where he was terrified of ever seeing Esau again. And if you remember, God used that encounter with Esau to radically impact the heart of Jacob rather than Esau killing him, which he had vowed to do. He vowed that he was going to get revenge and that he was going to kill Jacob. But instead, God's hand was so on that meeting whenever Jacob faced his greatest fear, whenever he faced the consequence of his own actions, God actually used that encounter to show Jacob the face of God. If you remember that story, it's right after Jacob wrestled with God and saw the face of God. The very next morning, he goes and he meets Esau, and he thinks he's probably going to be killed by Esau and the 400 soldiers that Esau brought with him. But instead, they have this incredible restoration, this reconciliation, and Jacob says to him, seeing your face is like seeing the face of God. And so God redeemed what could have been his worst moment, and God used that moment to show Jacob something about himself. And so what we see in the life of Jacob is the process of God. We see a faithful God who chooses someone who refuses to leave them as they are, and the story is not primarily about Jacob's faithfulness. It's primarily about God's faithfulness. If you remember, whenever <clears throat> Jacob wrestles with God and his name is changed to Israel, God tells him, I'm changing your name. You'll no longer be called Jacob. You'll be called Israel. And then the next morning he goes and he meets Esau and he tells Esau, listen, I'm coming with you. I'm coming home. I'm going to settle back in our homeland and, uh, and Esau says, okay, well, uh, why don't you travel with me? And Jacob says, no, you know, we'll, we'll be right behind you. I've got, you know, all these animals and these children and these women. I don't want to drive them too hard. You go on ahead. I'll be right behind you. And then uh, Esau says, well, let me leave some of my men. I've got all these soldiers. That let me send them with you to protect you. And Jacob says, no, I don't want to put you out. You know, trust me, we'll be fine. You and all of your soldiers go on ahead. We'll be right behind you. And then what does Jacob do? He goes to a completely different city and he doesn't see Esau again for years. So right after the encounter where God changes his name and says, you'll no longer be called the deceiver, you'll be called Israel, Jacob goes right back to his old ways and he deceives Esau again and lies to him again. And then over the next few chapters, you see this whole story play out where Jacob's sons actually kind of deceive him. They kind of usurp him. And then at the end of this whole story, God comes to him again. God visits him again, and he changes his name again. He says, I will rename you Israel. And so God literally, after he already changed his name, and God's already been working on him for 20 or 30 years, God comes after him again and changes his name again 
just saying, I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to pursue you and we're going to accomplish this work in you. You know, God is at work in me and in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And he is going to pursue us and he's going to walk with us until he gets his way in our lives. Now, I I will say this about Jacob, that there is a pattern of worship in Jacob's life. Like there was with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, there was this pattern of worship and sacrifice, and they were continually remembering and uh, commemorating their encounters with God. So it, it wasn't that Jacob was indifferent I think he was hungry for God. I think that's what Psalm 24 was all about, you know, the generation of Jacob, those who seek the face of God, clean hands and a pure heart. They ascend the hill of the Lord. They lift up their heads and open the gates for the king of glory to come in. And so he was a man who sought the face of God and who was in pursuit of God. But all along the way, there's issues being worked out. There's you know, there's backsliding and there's there's stumbling and there's failure and God is faithful to pursue him and to continue to go after him because God had chosen him for a major purpose. You know, you're going to be Israel. You're going to be the father of the people of God. And as long as you continue to worship me and seek my face, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to deal with your enemies. My favor is going to be on you. Remember all the instances of the favor of God that we looked at in Jacob's life and all these instances of, you know, the heavens opening and God breaking in and doing the impossible. So the story is really about God, it's not really about him. And our story is really about God. It's not really about us. You remember Psalm 23, you know, we, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We will not fear for, uh, you know, for God, you are with me. Um, and uh, the, now I'm forgetting the verse. It talks about, um, it, it talks about, oh yeah, lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. That, that's sort of the heartbeat of Psalm 23. It's all about this remarkable relationship with God who is our shepherd. And the point of the story is not that God would lead us and that God would encounter us and that he would be very present in our lives so that we would be a big deal. No, Our lives are about God's namesake. They're about God's glory. Our life is, it's not primarily about us. It's primarily about him. You know, it's primarily about how awesome he is, not how awesome we are. And so whenever God is 352 times in the Bible reminding us of Jacob, whenever he's calling himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also a bunch of times he calls himself the God of Jacob. He is reminding us something about himself that's very important for us to remember. And I think whenever he's calling Israel, often he calls them Jacob instead of calling them Israel, just like God would sometimes revert back and call Jacob, Jacob instead of Israel. He's he's speaking to that part of them that is in process, that part of them that is being transformed, that is being sanctified. And I think there's a really healthy perspective for us to have because self-focus, if our life is all about us, you know, if we're doing well, we're going to be pride, you know, in pride and, uh, and arrogance. And if we're doing poorly, we're going to be in condemnation and shame and you know, self-focus, making it all about us is a major trap. It's a stumbling block. But being God-focused, you know, being Christ-centered, being our lives being about Him, you know, set your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Think about that, you know, set your eyes on Him because He is the author. He is the perfecter. You know, he's at work in us to do and to will of his good pleasure. If God is the author of my my life and the perfecter of my faith, then that means he's the one who's writing my story. It means that I'm not even the one who's perfecting my faith. It means that, 
you know, yes, I'm going to worship and I'm going to seek the face of God and I'm going to live in repentance and I'm going to, you know, as much as is in my power, align myself with the Lord. My story is never primarily about me. It's still primarily about a faithful God. You know, um, my wife and I, in the podcast we did a couple weeks ago, uh, we ended up, I think it was in the podcast, something we were doing together, we ended up talking about uh, 2 Corinthians 4, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassing greatness of the power it, uh, would be, it would be evident that that power is from God and not from us. You know, God doesn't want... He's not interested in people who are a beautiful, jeweled, you know, vase that is covered in, in brilliant and beautiful diamonds so that everybody looks at that vessel and says, wow, what an amazing vessel. No, God has intentionally chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. You know, he's uh, chosen the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are, and he's chosen earthen vessels so that it's evident that the surpassing greatness of the power is from God and not from us. And so I think that's probably the capstone lesson of the life of Jacob. And I think it's why God is repeatedly calling himself the God of Jacob, is we need to have this very clear in our heart, very clear in our spirit, that it's the faithfulness of God that makes our life remarkable. It's, it's all about him. It's not about us. This is very basic. This is very foundational. And after spending months looking at the life of Jacob, this may seem anticlimactic, but I think this is kind of the highest truth in Jacob's story. I think it's the most important lesson. It's the revelation is that, you know, I'll say this, I'm kind of glad that God doesn't repeatedly call himself the God of Joseph, right? Because the God of Joseph, Joseph's story is actually about, you know, rem this remarkable faithfulness uh, of Joseph. It's about, you know, decades of testing and him, you know, walking in near perfection. And at the end of the story, God redeems and does something impossible, does something amazing. You know, I'm half joking. I'm thankful for the God of Joseph, like I am the God of Jacob. Uh, but God chooses not to repeatedly remind us of the story of Joseph as though, you know, uh, because you do look at that vessel and you can't help but be impressed, right? You read the story of Joseph and you say, wow, you know, uh, through the betrayal and through the the mistreatment and the injustice and the testing and the trials that he he keeps his heart right and he has you know remarkable integrity and he's all through the story you know it, you can't help but be impressed with Joseph to be impressed with the vessel but i think god is much more interested in us being impressed with him than he is in us being impressed with any vessel so we can be thankful for the sovereignty of God. We can be thankful for the faithfulness of God. We want to be people who seek the face of God and who worship God. And we want to live with clean hands and a pure heart like Psalm 24 talks about. But ultimately, my life and your life is going to be great. It's going to be amazing and remarkable and impressive not because at the end of the story we were impressive, but because we have a God who is absolutely amazing. He's the one who's absolutely remarkable. So I think this is, you know, kind of the moral of the story. I think it's the most important thing uh, that we see about Jacob's life. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this this one does have to be short because I'm about to end and zoom across campus to uh, to get ready for tonight. But let me know in the chat your thoughts about the life of Jacob. I know not everybody's been with us for these four months, but what have been some of the things that have been remarkable about this story, either that you can really relate to or that you see and say, you know, thank God this is how he deals with men and women. 
So just give me some feedback on these last several months of, you know, how the dealings of God in the life of Jacob uh, maybe have ministered to you. Uh, other than that, I am going to have to end the stream, but I want to remind everybody, please share the video. If you haven't done that, let me know in the comments where you're watching from or if you have any feedback. That way I can see who's watching. Comments also kind of help the algorithm to pay attention and get this out in front of more people. Um, but let's go ahead and pray, and we're going to go ahead and conclude for the night. Oh, and I'll mention again, if you want to be on our email list, so you know about the podcast and the prayer and worship and that kind of thing that we have coming up, just send us an email at supernaturaltheology at gmail.com. All right, so God, we do thank you that you are faithful. God, that you pursue us, that you are with us. God, we thank you that you want us to be open heavens people. God, that heaven would invade the earth through our lives but it's not because we are impressive. It's because you are an amazing God. And we thank you that you've chosen us. We thank you that you are faithful. We thank you, God, that we can, we can put all of our trust and all of our weight on you. And you're never going to fail us. You're never going to let us down, God. You're never going to fail to do what you said you would do. And so, God, we thank you tonight that you are the God of Jacob. We thank you tonight that you are persistent in your pursuit of us. And we say, God, continue to pursue us, continue to chase us down, continue to awaken our heart to be worshipers, to be God seekers and God chasers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me. And uh, some of you, I might be with you here in a minute uh, at the, the event tonight. So I'll see you soon. Thank you for joining us tonight.